I'm Jody Sweeten, and welcome to today's episode of Awkward Conversations. Uh, I am joined today by two really wonderful guests. I've got Amy McCarthy here with us today, and also Aaron Wick, who is the Senior Director of Behavioral Health and Student Support. We really, really appreciate you being here, Aaron. Today, we're talking a lot about peer pressure. And, you know, I did an episode of my podcast, never thought I'd say this recently, on peer pressure. And one of the things that I didn't really think about is that peer pressure can sometimes be good. It can be good or bad. It can it can move you in a direction of sort of staying with, you know, the choices that you want to make, or it can pressure you into doing things that that you don't want to. And, you know, a majority of teens often find themselves in situations of peer pressure, and that is what leads to substance use. So I'd love to hear uh, you, you ladies talk a little bit about peer pressure, how it affects teens, what we can look out for, how do we help our teens make the best choices for their friends and their situations? Well, I think one of the things about peer pressure is to really start talking to your kids early about inter interactions socially with, with friends, with community members, how to engage with people in ways um, that are helpful. Um, because again, if we start having those conversations when our kids are young, it makes it a lot easier as they get older to really have some of those skills ahead of time to, to help them be effective in communicating with um, their peer group. One thing I think about in addition to the positive and negative kind of aspects of peer pressure are the kind of indirect forms of peer pressure versus direct forms of peer pressure and how, you know, there can be, I think when I think of peer pressure or maybe when I was like learning about peer pressure and resisting peer pressure, it was always kind of talked about like someone's going to come up to me and be like, yeah, you should have a drink like, <laughs> and, and, you know, I should take it. But I don't think it's always that kind of blatantly obvious. I think it's, you know, sometimes oh, like the kids in my class are talking about going and having a party this weekend and they're going to be drinking or using substances. And I don't want to feel other than those people. Um, and I want to be included and I want to feel like I'm, I'm a part of this group. And so I'm going to then join in, you know, kind of more or less, even if people at that party are saying, you don't have to drink, you don't have to drink to be here. There's sometimes that group think kind of kicks in and that can be somewhat dangerous when it comes to, to peer pressure overall. And being the safe place for your child to have those, those conversations with, because that's exactly right. I mean, it's not always as blatant as we're going to be drinking at this party. Um, you know, and, and all of our kids, all of us want to be connected with a peer group. And so we don't want to be different. And so being able to have those conversations with your, with your children ahead of time and help them be able to have that place or really building that uh, relationship with other adults, you know, the aunts, the uncles, the community members, I think really building that community for our kids is important as well, so that it's not just always us, but also that they have some other adults to look up to within their their world. Absolutely. I was actually talking about that on another episode, how I have some really wonderful um, friends who I, I've known for years and years who have become kind of aunties to my girls. And I've told my girls, you know, look, I, I know that there may be things as you get older that maybe you don't want to come to me about. You're worried what mom's going to think or you're worried about getting in trouble. But I want them to know they have safe people in their lives who I trust who I know will help them and who are trusted adults that they can go to. And I think that's really important for kids to know whether it's their teacher or their principal or, you know, a mom's best friend or an aunt or somebody like that to know that, you know, yes, parents are critical to all of this, but also that, you know, it takes a village mentality and that, and that back to the building relationships point, you know, the more we surround our kids with relationships, healthy relationships, both of peers and adults, I think the more, um, protected they are to help themselves make better choices. Yeah, it's the number one factor in terms of like, you know, resilient children and positive outcomes for development is having one positive, at least one positive kind of adult in your life. And it doesn't always have to be a caregiver or a parent, which is like you said. And so, you know, in, in opening up those doors for those relationships to be there. Um, and I think it's great to be able to make your child aware that it doesn't have to be you if they don't, if they don't feel ready or comfortable to bring it to you as the parent, that there are other options and, and feeling trustworthy of those other, or trustful of those other adults in their lives. And I know there's so many different ways that you can work with your kids to try and uh, prepare them for peer pressure and, and, and you know, sort of tell them a, a little bit about social dynamics if you feel this, this is, you know, here's how you might respond. Um, you know, and, I, and that's hard because it's hard for us to, you know, experience the, the lives of our kids and sort of speak for them. So I think what's really important too is, you know, 
finding their voice and how would you say no? I always tell my kids, I go, blame me. Tell them, oh my God, my mom is so strict and she's so lame. And like, if I did that, she'd kill me. Or like, oh no, I, my mom's got to pick me up. My girls know under any circumstance, you text me, I'm there. So, you know, I think laying those ground rules are also really important and, and letting your kids know that, you know, if you text me from your friend's party on Friday night and you're uncomfortable and you text me, you know, whatever code word we have, I'll be there. I'll pick you up. No questions asked. We go home. We'll deal with it tomorrow. But, I, you know, I know that my girls have that safe space to come to and I hope that they use it. And that's so important because I, I mean, I think that being proactive in this and helping, you know, have those conversations so your kids have the words and have the confidence to have those conversations before it's in a really sticky situation where they can't say no or they really are just um, at a point where they're stuck. Um, so being able to role play that and have those conversations and help them, you know, explore what would you do in this situation. Um, and and I think for, for me with my older son, it was really just kind of randomly asking those questions, you know, and um, not when there was an incident, but when there was just time to just talk when we're walking and having those, you know, what are what are your friends dealing with these days? How are things going in school? You know, who are your friend groups? Because you really need to get to know who your friends, um, who their friends are and who their parents are. So you're kind of building that community as well so that you kind of have your ear to the ground. Always. I find that uh, rides with my kids and their friends to and from events or school or whatever, or if they have friends over to the house and I can just sort of fade into the background, it's really sometimes the best way to find out what's going on. What's going on with your kids? Watch them interact, listen to how they deal with their friends. And, you know, they'll start talking about stuff and kind of forget you're there. And you can really get a gauge on what's going on in your, in your kids' social lives. Now, there are so many ways that we can help our kids to uh, combat peer pressure and to really, you know, stand up to it. And I think one of the most important things, too, is having an ally. Have a friend that's a peer who you know is a good influence, who resists peer pressure, who, you know, will really stand up not only for themselves, but with their friends. You know, it's a lot easier to say no or to resist something when you aren't alone. And, you know, finding those allies when you put yourself in those situations, I think can also be really important, right? Yeah, that that's absolutely critical. I mean, if, if your children have, you know, a, a friend or two that really are on the same pathway that have the same goals and really can it can strengthen each other, it, it's super important. And then as a parent, also knowing who those kids are and and it's really it's OK as a parent to share with your child and your child's friends what your expectations are for them. It's OK to raise the bar and it's OK to say, here's how here's how, you know, I want you to deal with these things. And how how do you think you'll deal with them? It's OK to share those perspectives. I think being able to also like um, find places and activities for your kids, like, you know, where, where A, they just might be kind of, you know, involved in, in activities. So they're not as likely to kind of just start going out and partying because they're bored or they're finding other, other friends who aren't kind of connected to their community is really important. Not to say that those activities don't mean that they will find peers who are involved in kind of unhealthy behaviors or activities. But I think then, then there's an opportunity to monitor that. Um, but, it also kind of comes to the idea of an ally points to like the idea also of perception not always being reality. And, you know, so often I hear from young people like everybody is vaping at school, like every single person is vaping at school. And while the incidence of, you know, vaping has gone up in young, young people, no doubt, the, the reality is that not everybody is vaping at school. But when you walk into the bathroom and like, you know, four or five people are vaping every time you go into the bathroom, it's going to feel like your school of 500 people, someone is always vaping. Um, and so being able to also introduce that piece of the conversation, I think too, like the people who are having parties, that might be, the parties are loud. Like the friends sitting at home and having a movie night and eating Swedish fish and popcorn, like aren't probably going to be making as much noise, um, you know, as the folks who are maybe having like a huge party. And so, you know, being able to introduce the fact that you know, there is an alternative and the alternative is includes so many people who aren't partaking, you know, in, in substance use or again, un other unhealthy behaviors. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, for every ally friend you have, uh, there's always, you know, as parents, we always have, 
usually the one friend that we that we sort of dread our kids hanging out with because there's usually someone in their sphere of influence that causes them to to uh, participate in some bad decisions that sort of pulls them a little bit further down the road than maybe uh, they would be comfortable on doing on their own. And I, I remember my mom had this great quote because um, I had several friends that she didn't like. But, uh, <laughs> and it wasn't even that she didn't like them. She, what she told me was, that friend does not bring out the best in you. That friend you make poor decisions with. So my mom, it was not about vilifying the friend. I think that's really important because when we vilify, particularly with a team, we're like, that's bad, that's this. Oftentimes the first thing they want to do is go right back to the thing that you said not to do. <laughs> you know, how do we deal with some of those like maybe problematic friends as a parent and helping our kids through those relationships to figure out for themselves what people are maybe a good influence and what people maybe aren't in their lives? Well, and I think sometimes, you know, when you have those those children who maybe are not making the best decisions, having those conversations with your own child about, you know, what kind of decisions are they making and what kind of consequences are they having and why do you think that they're making those decisions? And is that something that you want to be around or, you know, like, is, is there, are there ways that you can invite them into a positive, you know, uh, environment? Because again, those kids are still going to be around. And so it's really trying trying to figure out the pathway to help your child um, either completely, you know, change that dynamic or also, you know, pull that kid into the positive relationship, depending on the dynamic. Yeah, I love that so much because those children are also still growing up and figuring things out. And, you know, so, so like you said, Jody, like, let's not vilify them. Like, let's figure out, you know, is there a way to pull them into the positive kind of fold, um, you know, versus kind of exiling them? So, you know, each of our children are so different. And, you know, even between my two boys, they're very different. And so it's so important to kind of know, like, their their strengths and their weaknesses and, and what they're really confident in. And, and that way, we really can help to adjust our conversations and help with their strategies for dealing with peer pressure, positive and negative. Um, and, and so I think that that's really critical and, and we do that through early, right? Proactive. So we want to, we want to start getting to know all of those strengths really early on, which sounds like, well, duh, but it really is challenging because there's a lot of conversations to have with our children and some of them are awkward and not so, so, uh, comfortable at times. And so, but those are the real, the real important pieces that also build resiliency in our kids. Now, you were talking about sort of different personality types, and I know one of the things that, you know, we, we were talking about, too, is really fitting a, a response to peer pressure that is appropriate for your individual child. What might, you know, I know between my two girls, like you said, very different. What would what my older one would say versus what my younger one would say would be probably very different because they're very different people. Um, you know, what are some of the different personality types Um that we see in kids, you know, more shy, more reserved. How do we help each one of them find their voice? Yeah. And, and, you know, again, finding, finding their strengths and then working on those. So if you have a really shy child, really trying to prepare them with, um, what they're comfortable doing. Uh, because again, we see, well, I'd rather come in the side door of the school. I just don't want to even, you know, the, I don't want to, be in that group, right? They're so nervous and so, um, so stressed about that. And so helping them, you know, go walk through that slowly, give them ways to, to breathe and think through that. Um, and then you could also have, you know, your child who's very confident and, and they're just going to like, you know, name call back and do those things. And that's not helpful either. Right. And so, again, it's like um, like how do we help each child? And and it's so individualized. And and again, you know, look, knowing the resources in your school, knowing that there's a lot of things happening within PTAs and different sessions where you can take these classes as a parent and learn a little bit more. Um, and communicate with your with your um, your friends and your community because most of us are dealing with this, and so it's really helpful to see what strategies other parents are using. The pandemic has really changed kind of 
all the connections of how we're living and how we're, <laughs> right, how we're connecting back into society again. And we're all stressed and we all want to take the side door. Um, it's not really an option. <laughs> and so, so now we're relearning how to like walk together. And I think that that's just such a great um, way to think of with our children. It's like we're trying to walk with them and help them through these doors um, individually. I find myself with my kids that sometimes, you know, when, when I'm, when I admit things I don't know, or when I go, you know, that's, I don't, that's really, let me, let's think about that. Like, I don't know how to respond to that yet. Or like, oh, that really hurt. Let me take a minute. Or, you know, what, having my kids watch me walk through emotions and sometimes not have the answers right away um, is, is hard. I hate that. I want to be mom that knows everything and like has every situation handled. Um, but I've learned to allow my children to be a part of that process a little bit. And like you said, walking through that with them and showing them as an adult, sometimes you still don't have all the answers and you still need to take a minute and you still need to think and, and process through things. And that's OK. And, um, you know, and, and as an adult, we face peer pressure as well. We face, you know, oh, I don't want to go do this thing or I don't want, you know, whatever. How do we deal with that? And, you know, again, it comes back to modeling that behavior that that we want our children to see. And we don't always do it perfectly. You know, there's no perfect parenting. We're all doing our best and we're all trying to walk on this journey together and really teach each other. And I, I really think that that problem solving piece is so important. And, you know, in our house, we call it the choose your own adventure. And so it's like, okay, here's strategy A, and this might happen. And then what might happen if we choose strategy B, right? And it's like, okay, these two things could happen. And so really, you know, helping our kids have those problem solving skills is so important from a young age and not just giving them answers, but really having them think through those pieces that, that, you know, really, again, build resiliency, which is what we're trying to do is, is continue to build resiliency because we're all going to face bullying. We're all going to face peer pressure, you know, stress and, and every day, most, most days, right. There's some stress in our lives. And so just building that resiliency um, daily and helping kids have a voice and build their confidence, right? I mean, that's that's what we want. We want to build confident children. I was thinking about, as you were mentioning that, Erin, you know, what we were talking about earlier around, you know, peer pressure, sometimes being like a symptom of a fear of, you know, feeling like kind of isolated or other and how complex the emotion set is when it comes to kind of thinking about a child who is responding to peer pressure and then is kind of behaving in those ways. And, um, you know, I think something for parents to kind of consider, it, it can just be so frustrating. We can react with, you know, upset and frustration and anger even. And so to take a step back from that and be able to look at like, you know, what are the underlying emotions that are playing into your child responding to peer pressure and how can we kind of build some empathy and come from a place of empathy and concern? Saving lives means staying informed. Knowing the dangers of using counterfeit prescription pills can help those you care about and keep our community safe. As a parent, educator, neighbor, or friend, we all play a role in building safe and healthy futures for ourselves and our loved ones. Do your part. Take the first step today. Visit GetSmartAboutDrugs.com to access education, prevention, and treatment resources. Counterfeit prescription pills laced with fentanyl are deadly. Be their protector. Be informed. Visit GetSmartAboutDrugs.com. Well, emotional intelligence is so critical uh, and, and so many people, I think, you know, have, have gone through their lives not really paying attention to it. But I think now we're much more aware of how much emotional intelligence really plays into success and really plays into well-being and feelings of happiness and contentment. And, um, you know, that's one of the things that I, I really stress to my girls all the time is, you know, life isn't always going to be perfect, but how do we deal with those things that get put in front of us? That is, that's the, the living part, you know? So in thinking about parents too, like adults are just as susceptible to kind of the impacts of peer pressure too. And um, I think it's just really important for parents to, you know, be aware of the moments where that might be happening and where they might be, you know, uh, you know, accidentally kind of, you know, showcasing that to their child. For sure. I mean, I, I know on social media, there's as much 
pressure on parents to be perfect, to have, you know, family content that they're producing or everyone's getting along. And, you know, that's not always the case. And so when we see that, we think that that's how we're supposed to be. And that's just not always the case, you know. And the thing that I always, always, always like to go back to is there is no perfect parenting. Just be present and listen. Uh, and I just want to thank you ladies so much for coming and joining me today. Um, Amy, you're always a pleasure to have on the show. You're here every week. I love it. Um, Aaron, thank you so, so much. You provided so much great information about peer pressure, both for kids and for parents, uh, and how we can best deal with it. And uh, yeah, thank you ladies for coming and having a not so awkward conversation with me. And uh, I hope that we have helped some people out there. Coming up on the next episode of Awkward Conversations. There are more kids that are taken to the ER from accidental ingestion of medication than actually even car accidents. You don't have to wait for April or October to roll around. Every day is take back. If you visit DEATakeBack.com, you can find a list of all those locations that will collect these unneeded medications any day of the, of the year. Um, that comes with having a, a great relationship with their child and uh, educating them. You have to educate them. Um, we've had a spike of also uh, kids ingesting marijuana edibles um, and other opioids uh, within the home. So uh, we really recommend that these medications are locked up. You know, uh, a healthy and safe product for us, you know, several years ago may not be anymore. Make sure to check out GetSmartAboutDrugs.com. Parents, caregivers, you can find so many resources of great information there about how to talk to your kids and make these conversations a little less awkward. A huge thank you to the Elks DAP, which is the largest all-volunteer nationwide drug awareness program, and also a huge thanks to the DEA for their outreach program and for making this possible. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Awkward Conversation series are solely those of the individuals, speakers, commentators, experts, and or hosts involved, and do not necessarily reflect nor represent those of the production, associates, or broadcaster, or any of its employees. Production is not responsible and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in the series available for viewing. The primary purpose of this series is to educate and inform. This series does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. This series is available for private, non-commercial, Commercial use only. The production, broadcaster, or its channel cannot be held accountable for all or any views expressed during this program.